Shabbat Shalom. If you guys open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, verses 5 through 29, we'll get there eventually, not right away, but at least you have it ready, a big passage. Um, the, the, we have finished the re reading of Book of Numbers today, the Midbar, and the book is you know, full of various events, full of a lot of countings, of course, but, but full of a lot of events. And like from the leaving the Mount Sinai to the spies to the all kinds of plagues, rebellions, battles, who you name it, all kinds of things. And it ends kind of on a on a whimper, or with a whimper, if you think about it. I mean, what does it end with? If you look at the end of the book of Numbers, it adds to a very small episode where uh, sons of Menashe, the, the leaders of the tribe of Menashe, come to Moses. And they say, uh, they bring up this, uh, the case of the daughters of Tzlovchad. If you remember, there was the, Tzlovchad was a gentleman tribe of Menashe. He didn't have any sons. He only had daughters. And uh, according to the Torah, um, he, his, like, he was from that generation whose sons get lands divided. Like he's from that, like below the generation, this is where the division of the land happens and uh, by the families by the sons. He has no sons, so therefore they came and said, well, not fair, you know, we should also have uh, an inheritance, and uh, God agrees, and this whole set of laws is given that, yes, they get inheritance, and it's all, seems like it's over, but it's not really over, because at the end, the Menashe leaders come, and they say, yeah, you gave them that inheritance, what if they get married outside a tribe? Then their son's going to get it, and, and the, 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 the land will go to a different tribe. That's not fair. So they say, okay, fine. So they work out a compromise. They're going to marry their cousins. They marry their cousins. Ooh, gross. But, <laughs> but I mean, at that time it wasn't. But that, that's the compromise they, 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 have, they have come up with. Okay, fine. I mean, okay, I mean, it, it, it's, it's interesting, I, I suppose. But to end the book of, like, these are like, the Torah laws end with that. Deuteronomy pretty much repeats the laws. I mean, that's here and there. But, but the bulk of the laws of the Torah, they're kind of ended. Deuteronomy, that's why it's Deuteronomio. It's like um, second giving of the repetition of the law. So it kind of, it repeats a lot of things. So commandments in Deuteronomy, a lot of them repeat it. Uh, and the new commandments are kind of done here. So you end all the commandments with this. I mean, you probably should end with some kind of illustrious summary and you know, admonition and all that. No, it's like this little episode. So, okay, so what, with what does the book of Numbers start then? Maybe perhaps we can, uh, we can you know, deduce why it ends that way from the way it starts. And it starts with the countings of the Jewish people. It starts with the counting of the Jewish people for the purpose of uh, inheritance of the land. Uh, well, it starts with the counting of the Jewish people for the purpose of counting who's in the army. Uh, why in the army? Because the army is going to go and inherit the land. Because you know these people are not living on their own accord. They need to be. Uh, they need to be battled out of there. Even though God is, of course, but they need to be battled. So it starts with 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 the Jewish people, and chronologically, it starts in the second year, in the first month. Second year, the first month. What happened then? It was the time when the tabernacle was inaugurated. It starts with the inauguration of the tabernacle. The book of Numbers chronologically starts with that, with that occurrence. Um, and so if it, <laughs> but the, because, because it has this enumerate, chronologically starts with the tabernacle, but because it starts with this, with the um, numbering of the Jewish people for the purpose of inheritance of the land kind of stands to reason that it also ends with the inheritance pa uh, passage. So it starts about inheritance and it ends with inheritance. And the fact that like the last like uh, episode is kind of little, to me, what that means is basically Torah tries to cover every eventuality that has to do with inheritance. Like even with that, even that, like this eventuality is now covered as well. So basically, from the beginning to the end, the book is about inheriting the land. Even though, ironically enough, the book is called In the Desert. 
So they kind of, they, the book about inheritance, all, all is passed outside of the land. And so, yeah, and it starts with the tabernacle. It inaugurates the era of the tabernacle um, that really, uh, that, uh, it, and, and, that, and that's the world, the world of the, ta- the era of the tabernacle is, is the world after the sin of the golden calf, really. Because <sighs> arguably the tabernacle is given as the aftermath of the golden calf. Um, very simply ex- to explain it, you wanted something tangible to worship, that's the wrong way, here's the right way. If you really want something, something to touch, here's, here's you touch this. Don't touch that, touch this. You know, it's like a safe toy as opposed to a dangerous one that God gave to his children, being the tabernacle. And, um, and, it, it, and it's interesting because at the same time, this world after the flood, oh, sorry, sorry, after, after the golden calf, it's similar to the world after after the expulsion from Eden, perhaps, or after, after the flood, being the world that exists, only not on such an illustrious level. Because if you think about it, what's better? To have this beautiful temple, golden, and all that kind of stuff, with all the mystery and the Holy of Holies and the priesthood and all the ceremony and the very majest- majestic, what's better, this or the ability to talk to God in your backyard? What's better? It was a rhetorical question. <laughs> Thank you for answering that, Ron. As usual, can count on you. Um, it's, I mean, the temple is prettier than my backyard, but the ability to talk to God, to approach God without, without impediment, of course, is much better, without any intermediary in front, without any buffers. Without any, tabernacle is a buffer. Just like uh, the, the, the road of the tree of the, the path of the tree of life in the garden was, was guarded by the angel with the sword, so is the way of the Holy of Holies has curtains with angels on them. It's the same thing. It's guarding the way of the tree of life. So it's, 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 it's to, to show that it's, a, it's an aftermath of something. The, I mean, the aftermath of, like, you know, f- f- fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, shame on well, the other way around. Fool me once, shame on you, shall me, fool me twi- twi- twice, shame on me. Um, that's, that, that, that kind of situation where, you know, in a relationship, you know, when, when one, one party betrays the other, I mean, the other party can betray, betray can forgive the betrayer, but it's not going to be the same. It's going to linger. I mean, it, it can forgive completely, but at the same time, eh, you know. There's already some kind of a situation that, that, that lingers, and, and it creates a distance. And so that, that tabernacle temple is a distance that was created and the aftermath of the golden calf. So it's, it's some kind of a, it's added because of the transgression, right? And it's interesting also, the cherubim uh, on, the, on the curtains uh, and the calf or an ox, they're interchangeable figures. Cherubims and oxes, Oxes, oxen. oxen, cherubim and oxen are interchangeable. How do we know that? Because of Ezekiel, when they're 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 four they animals of the four faces in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter one, each each uh, this creature Hayot have four faces: face of a man, face of an eagle, face of a lion, face of an ox. In Ezekiel chapter ten, again those same beasts they appear where it's the face of a man, face of a lion, face of an eagle, and face of a cherub. So ox and cherub are interchangeable. And, and so somehow cherubim are a replacement of a golden calf. Like it's a kosher golden calf. So temple is a, is a kosher golden calf. So, and so the, the era of the inheritance is inaugurated by this tabernacle. And, and, and the inheritance of the land for us, for the Jewish people, always meant wars. From beginning to the end, there were wars. The wars never stopped. There were strange wars, because they didn't depend necessarily on military might. Actually, they did not depend on military might at all. They always depend on observance of the commandments by the Jewish people. If the Jewish people were righteous, they won wars. If the Jewish people were wicked, they lost wars. The, the weapons and armies were very secondary. 
very secondary. Sometimes the weak enemy defeated them, and sometimes a strong enemy ran away, and there's no rhyme or reason. Uh, there is a rhyme or reason because of the observance of the commandment, or because of the closeness of God. You know, and what they took, took with them in battle, they took with them the implements of the tabernacle. Tabernacle became some kind of a, a symbol of God's presence. They took the symbol of God's presence into the battle. Did it help them? Uh, only if they were righteous. If they were not righteous, it didn't help them either. <laughs> so it's not like it was a magic weapon. It was just a, it was, it was a representation of God's presence. And if, if God's presence was with them because of righteousness, they won all the battles and, and not even suffer any casualties. And that's what happened in this war against Midian. And in this Torah portion, they went and fought against Midian, 12,000 people. They came, they went to war, they came back, and, and they lost no, nobody, nobody. They lost nobody. They had no casualties. And they took, tab they took the, the, the ark with them and all that. Why? Because, again, they, they were going by the word of the Lord. They were the right, they, at that point, they were righteous. And Jericho is another example. They circled, the whole thing fell off. Because that, that's, it's, it's, it, you know, it only depends on God. Um, otherwise, you know, but that was not always the case. Actually, it was almost never, it, it, it was very rarely the case. The war has never stopped. We never came into our full inheritance of the land, even the minimum inheritance, which is from the river to the sea. That's the minimum borders. The maximum borders are from Nile to Euphrates, which are yet to be realized. Actually, looking, looking around kind of seem much more realistic because they're gonna, they, they are gradually being surrounded by failed state states that will be easy to take over those territories, you know, starting with Syria, Lebanon's next probably. So it's not unrealistic to see how that can happen, right? But throughout our history, we never came into the full inheritance. We always fought the wars because we were always far. So this inheritance, and now in, from Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 29, says this. It says, brothers, I speak in human terms. Even with a man's covenant, once it has been confirmed, no one cancels or adds to it, which is interesting because that's our Torah portion. Matot, it starts with that. It starts with, the, with, in, with oaths, and if it's a guy who does the oath, that, that's uncancelable. No one can cancel. If, if it's a woman that does the oath, it can be canceled by a husband or a father. But if the guy makes an oath, it cannot be canceled. So here is that, that's, worth, that's what it refers to. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. It doesn't say, and to seeds, as, as to many battles of one, and to your seed, who is the Messiah. What I'm saying is this. Torah, which came 430 years later, which is interesting, 430 years later from Abraham, which it, it's tradition, it, it, it corresponds to the tradition that the slavery in Egypt did not last 400 years. It lasts, according to tradition, lasted 210 years only. And 430 years is from the covenant between the parts. That, that's the time from then until Exodus. So that's Galatians, for Paul confirms in Galatians that chronology. 430 years later, does not cancel the covenant previously confirmed by God so as to make the promise ineffective. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on promise. Well, what, why? Because the law came later, the promise came earlier. Promise came 430 years earlier to Abraham. Promise of inheritance of the land, because God promised inheritance, children, and land. But God has graciously given it to Abraham by means of a promise. So that's, that's, what, the, that's, what, it, that's what the inheritance is based upon. Then why the Torah? It was added because of transgressions, just like the temple was added because of the golden calf. So is the entire Torah. It's the same, it's the same principle. It's added because of the transgressions. Go, uh, temple is just a representation of the principle of the Torah giving. Te commandments of the temple embedded in the Torah is given in response to transgression. Until the seed would come to whom the promise has been made, which is the Mashiach. It was arranged through angels by the hand of the intermediary. Angels that are depicted on the curtains of the Holy of Holies. Now an intermediary who is Moses is not one party alone, but God is one. Then is, uh, intermediate is not for one party alone, because it's for the whole people. Okay. Then the Torah against the promises, then is the Torah against the promises of God? May it never be. 
For a law had been given that could impart life, certainly righteousness would have been based on the law. So, of course, we know that, that the righteousness is not from the law, that the life is not from the law. But the scripture has locked up the whole world under sin, so that the promise based on trust in Messiah Yeshua might be given to those who trust. So again, the law, the Torah, is like that safe toy that... That is for kids. It's like the tabernacle is a safe toy. This you can touch. You know, you're not, it's not going to blow up on you. It's not the car that will drive off a cliff. It's a toy car. So until you know how to drive. And so that, that is the whole premise of the Torah. Here is the commandments that, that, that keep you safe and, and not make you drive off the cliff. Now, before faith came, we were being guarded on the Torah bound together until the coming faith would be revealed. Therefore, the Torah became our guardian to lead us to the Messiah, so that we might be made right based on trusting, on faith. But now that the faith has come, we are no longer under guardian. That means what? We are no longer under Torah. Okay, let's talk about this a little later, in, in a second. For if you are all sons of God through trusting in Messiah Yeshua, for all of you who were immersed in Mashiach have closed yourself with Mashiach. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Messiah Yeshua. That is what has been eliminated. The, separ the separation between Jews and non-Jews, the separation between men and women, and the separation between, between slave and free, in the eyes of what? In the eyes of, uh, you know, <laughs> mostly actually in, in the eyes of the access to God through the tabernacle. Because what? There's no longer court of Jews and Gentiles. There's no longer court of men and women. Well, there's no courts of slave and free. There's no such thing. But slaves surely did, would not, were not in charge of their own schedule and couldn't go to the tabernacle at any time. But now they can, because now they can go out to the backyard and pray over there too. So therefore, in this, in this respect, there is no difference. Because otherwise, the commandments, they still stand. They don't go away anywhere. I mean, you still cannot kill, you still cannot steal, you still cannot, you know, do these things the Torah prohibits from doing. You still need to love your neighbor as yourself. This is all the Torah pro That did not go anywhere. What did go anywhere is the commandments of separation is the buffer. The buffer went away. The buffer that took that kept us away from God, that has been taken away. And that's a good and that is the guardian. The guard rails came off in that respect. Because why? Because it is expected that those who are believers in Mashiach Yeshua that they're mature enough and they don't need to be reminded anymore, don't kill, don't kill, don't steal, don't steal. I mean, okay, I'm, I'm uh, you know simplifying that but but they don't have to be reminded anymore to be a moral person because it has to come naturally to a person who is the believer in Mashiach that these things in this naturally is not even a question of, of, of this particular you know of, of a struggle it has to be no struggle about these things theoretical theoretical but the struggle therefore continue but the struggle still continues the struggle that is not against flesh and blood, the struggle that is spiritual, the war for the inheritance have not ceased. It's just translated into a spiritual realm from the physical realm. That's what happened. The war for the inheritance has been um, transformed into a spiritual warfare. It says in Ephesians, in the known passage, Ephesians 6.10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his, and, power, and his mighty power. Put on full armor of God so you're able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against worldly forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up full armor of God so that you may be able to resist when the times are evil. And after you have done everything, stand firm. Stand firm then. Buckle the belt of truth around your waist, put on breastplate of righteousness, strap your feet in readiness with the good news of shalom, of peace. Above all, take up shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Ruah, in the spirit, for every occasion with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, keep alert with perseverance supplication for all the saints and pray for me that I open my mouth to make known my, with boldness mystery of the good news for which I am ambassador in chains, Paul says. Pray that I speak boldly 
the way that I should. So how does this spiritual warfare look like? I mean, does it look like binding spirits? Like naming the spirits and binding them? Is this how it looks like? Scripture does not have any evidence of that. Um, like, you know, they, the, 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 the scripture that brought about very often is Daniel and the Prince of Persia situation where Daniel is praying for three weeks and there is this battle in heaven between the angel and the Prince of Persia and then the Michael comes and assists. By the way, nothing changes. There's a battle against Prince of Persia going on right now. Um, but uh, the, the truth is, it doesn't say that Daniel was battling the Prince of Persia. Daniel was just praying. He didn't know what was going on. He had no visibility into, into that. So we have no visibility into what, 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 what's going on with angels and all that kind of stuff. People who say they do, I don't know. I don't know. You know, the suspect. Um, we don't have any visibility into that. So the spiritual warfare is not binding spirits and angels. The spiritual warfare is fighting against, not against the flesh and blood of another person, but it's, it's, it's con the battle that is conducted in, in the with the spiritual means, which is the prayer, which is supplication, which is observance of the commandments, because observance of commandments is spiritual. This is the battle not against somebody's flesh. It's a battle against my own flesh. Amen. It's, not a ba it, 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 it's not a battle against flesh and blood, but it is in a way, because it's a battle against my own flesh and blood, my own flesh, my own desires, my own selfishness. That is spiritual warfare. And we see the enemy, and the enemy is us. You know, the whole, the, the, that's true. That's true in, in the spiritual warfare situation. That is true. My only enemy is myself. I mean, the devil, but devil is acting upon me through my flesh. This is how he does these things. And if I give, give, give room to, 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 to the enemy, then I lost. And it's, all, it's, it's up to me, not up to him. So I have to battle against myself and against my own desires, against my own, um, my own weaknesses. And all of these weapons, the spiritual weapons of warfare, it's, it's the quote from the, from the prophets. It's from Isaiah 59, where it says that God says this. He says, he saw God, or God saw, God saw that there was no one. He was astonished that no one was interceding. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation to him and his own righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He clothes himself in robes of vengeance, wraps himself with zeal, uh, in a zeal as a cloak. That's why it's called the armor of God, because God is the one who puts on this armor. When does the God puts on this armor? God puts on this armor when there is no one. He looks and there is no one. So when, when, is there, when is there someone? Then that person stands in God's place, puts on God's armor, stands in God's place and conducts the battle of God against what? Against sinfulness and against wickedness. <laughs> Being this person like in a, in a prophetic sense, because who is the prophet? The prophet is not necessarily the person who predicts the future, although it's possible. No, the prophet is the one who issues admonitions to his people prophetically, is the one who tells people to repent, is the one who urges the people to, to come closer to God and, and, and abandon the, the wicked ways. That is the function of the prophet. I mean, and if, if it takes a prophet to predict the future, to sell, tell you, if you're not going to do this, this is going to happen. I and mean, if you will do this, this is going to happen. And this happens <laughs> just like the prophet said. It's not for the purpose of predicting the future. It's purpose of change in the, in the present. Right, right. That, is the, that is the whole function of it. And that is, that is what the armor of God is about. It's about battling these battles in the present in order for the future to be won. In order for the victory to be won, in order for the inheritance to be received. To <laughs> the belt of truth, to stand for the truth regardless of consequences. Stands for righteousness regardless of uncomfortability and the desire for pleasure. Bring the good news regardless of persecution and shame to be able to speak the good news with boldness. The... the have faith with the shield of faith, regardless of any disappointments and inability to see all the, all, all the solutions, inability to see ahead. That's okay. Have the shield of faith and be, be guarded from that fear of the future. Helmet of salvation, regardless of state of affairs in the present, because the victory and salvation is assured, because salvation means victory. That's, that's the sense of the word. It's, it's a victory in the battle. And the word of God, the, the, having the sword of the word of God, regardless of the opposition that we encounter. Praying and acting in the spirit is what destroys all these strongholds. 
As it says in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, weapons of, weapons of warfare are not fleshly, but powerful through God for tearing down a stronghold. We are tearing down false arguments and every high-minded thing that, ex that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. We're taking every thought captive to the obedience of the Messiah. That's the warfare. What was the land, land of Israel? was full of strongholds, was full of armies, was full of all kinds of scary things. They were able to, to, to take it partially, but when they were able, they were able through their righteousness. And here our battle is spiritual battle against all these strongholds. What are they? It says they're false arguments. It's not, the, the battle is, these are not spirits, these are not angels in terms of what we're confronting. Maybe we're confronting them in the spiritual, but we don't see them again, we don't see any visibility. But what we have a visibility of is false arguments that we, that we are faced with, is lies and distortion of facts and concealment of truth that, is, that abounds today in, 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 a, in an amazing quantity. You look around, it's crazy how much, how much lies perpetuated from, from all kinds of sides. It does, and a lie is a lie. It doesn't matter who says it. Exaggeration lie. doesn't matter who says it. Even if your friend says a lie, it's a lie. You have to confront it if you know it's a lie. High-minded things. It's the, the pontification about science canceling religion, any of the types of beliefs and philosophies that contradict scripture. This is another stronghold that we're fighting against. And thoughts. We have to keep every, lead every thought captive. Thought, something that lead, tend to lead us, lead us astray. Our thoughts is what lead us astray. This is our battle. Our battle is again, it, 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 it's, 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 it's the battle of ideas. It's the battle of, of it, it's an intellectual battle. It's not, it's not a battle of, 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 you know, blowing things up. We know that, of course, but this is what we do. And it's also not a battle against unseen realm that, well, Yes and no, of course. It's not, it's not a, 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 a visible engagement of, of invisible things. That is impossible. It is engagement of visible things that are uh, non-physical, <laughs> if you know what I mean. The intellectual and conceptual things. And this is, where, this is, this is when we are able to enter into our inheritance. It says in Hebrews 4.11, it says, Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, which is what? Which is the inheritance, the land of, the land of Israel. Well, in, in this case, the inheritance means inheritance in the world to come, or, and that, which also results in the rest today, because when once is completely assured of the portion of the world, not that we're not assured, but at least we're assured of the fact that we're doing everything right. We're assured of the fact that we're not missing out of, on things, that every eventuality is covered, just like this little eventuality with the daughters of Slav had inherited. That's, the, that's a little eventuality, but they want to make sure everything is covered, that they're not missing anything, that they come with every possible, um, that, that, that every possible uh, uh, element of that inheritance is actually uh, redeemed and nothing is left on the table. So that's what we want. We want to make sure that nothing's left on the table. We want to make sure that we come to God with everything that, 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 that was possible to be achieved and accomplished. Therefore, it says, like every effort to enter that rest, so that, one, so that no one may fall through the same pattern of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than two-edged sword, piercing through a separation of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. No creature is hidden from him, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And then it goes, it continues, and the chapter of Hebrews ends with, therefore let us draw near to the throne of grace with boldness, so we may receive mercy and find grace for help in a time of need. That's where, that's beyond the curtain. That's in the presence of God that we can worship in spirit and in truth. That's, the time, that's, that's when we can be in the presence of God regardless of the place where we are situated. Then God will make our way prosperous. Then, then we'll have great success and no one will miss out. My greatest fear is the fear of missing out. If I fight a spiritual battle right against my flesh and subdue any desires that, that distract me and, and cause me to waste the time on things that are uh, secondary and unnecessary, then I will be able to have success and not miss out even on the smallest piece of the inheritance. That's, our, that's my prayer for us today. Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that we'll be able to discern between good and evil. 
I pray, Father, that you will give us the heart to know what is primary and what is secondary. Heart to know to w- on which to focus and which to ignore. Heart to know righteousness from wickedness, even in minute situations, and to choose righteousness. We pray, Father, that we'll be able to enter into your rest with all our inheritance intact. So we will be told, well done, good and faithful servants, so we'll leave nothing on the table, so we'll not be like a wicked servant who brings back the talent to the master and says, here's what is yours. We want to come back with an increase. We want to be told that, that this, is, this increase is due to, to our love towards you and observance of the commandments. Lord, we understand that the salvation is not by works, but we understand that the reward is by the works. And we want to receive the full inheritance that we can. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity. In Yeshua's name. Amen. All right.